Back in February, I interviewed skin microbiome specialist Dr. Thomas Hitchcock about some of the discoveries scientists are making around the microbes that live on our skin and the role they play in its health and appearance. My interview with him prompted a lot of questions from viewers, particularly around how skin care, including retinoids and acids, can affect the microbiome. So Dr. Hitchcock has kindly agreed to come back and answer your questions today. And he's impressively qualified for this discussion, having completed studies and research in genetics, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine at universities, including Clemson, Duke and Yale, as well as Well Cornell Medical College. And a reminder that Dr. Hitchcock told us that overwashing and overuse of skincare actives and preservatives can cause dysbiosis of the skin, which is an imbalance in the number and diversity of microbes that live there. He'll explain more in this interview about why that matters and why he believes the C. acnes bacteria that is one of the most abundant in our skin and which he includes in the products he helped create plays such an important role in skin health and appearance. Dr. Hitchcock, thank you so much for coming back onto the channel and being willing to be bombarded with questions about our skin microbiome again. Sure, my pleasure. <laughs> we could spend hours talking about it as you do on your podcast. I've been listening to that and enjoying it, um, but we, we still wouldn't cover everything because uh, as we're discovering, there is just so much to it and so much still to learn. My viewers had a lot of questions as I suspected, which is why I wanted to come back and do a follow-up. But um, I did want to start with a couple of questions that have been swimming around in my head for over the past couple of weeks. We know that key microbes on our skin, including C. acnes, uh, which you talked about, having them in the right balance and in the right places is important for the health of our skin. And we also think through research that a flourishing microbiome can have its own sun protective and anti-aging properties. Am I right so far? You are. We also believe that the overuse of skincare, um, and I want to drill into the detail of that shortly, can harm our microbiome and negatively affect the health of our skin if we get too carried away. But um, I read a fascinating article that popped up in The New Scientist just recently, and I'm going to link to it in the description. It's a really interesting one, and it basically linked the health of our skin with our wider health, which was something I wondered about last time. It was going as far as sort of linking a greater deterioration in the condition of our skin with a greater deterioration in our health and suggesting those two are linked. And I wondered what your view on that is. I mean, we know somebody who's very seriously burned, that's going to impact and, and jeopardize their whole health. So we know we know that the skin barrier is important from, from that perspective. But I mean, to what extent do you think our skin microbiome influences our wider health? Big question, I know. So uh, one thing that I tend to shy away from is saying the word microbiome too much to uh, correspond with what I call what we call the skin biome in general, which is the ecosystem of the skin which includes the microbiome. So the microbiome yeah. is simply the microbes that live in that ecosystem. The skin biome is the ecosystem itself. Yes. And one of the things that I think is very important to note is that while we are trying to have discussions to kind of parse out some of the, the details of what goes on mechanistically in this kind of ecosystem, it's all connected. And the skin is connected to the brain, is connected to the gut, is connected to everything in the body via the immune system that is circulating through basically. And if in the book that I wrote with Dr. Doris Day, we basically talked about this, how if you use the body's analogy to a, a house, you know, you have certain things that are connecting all the parts of the house. And while the outside exterior and the interior walls and all that stuff has its purpose, it's all kind of connected. Now, it's it falls apart at a certain point because the human body is way more integrated than even a house would be considered mm -hmm. um, because every cell in our body is integrated in some capacity. Um, and that's really where when you see health deteriorate in skin, skin becomes very much a mirror of overall health. 
Um, you can ask any dermatologist. They can actually tell some signs and symptoms of things wrong with you other than your skin just by looking at your skin. And so there's quite a bit that's integrated there. Now, that being said, you know, it's while it is kind of a mirror of what's going on internally can also affect what's going on internally as well. Just like your gut can affect your skin, your skin can affect your gut. And the way it does that is via the, again, the immune system. If you have something that's causing inflammation chronically on your skin, it's going to systemically, that that inflammation doesn't just stay in the skin, it systemically can spread as well. Because the immune system, while they there is some um, localization of immune cells for like infections and stuff, if you have a chronic condition, that's why things like psoriasis uh, is uh, uh, associated with psoriatic arthritis, you know, because it's a systemic condition. So what's manifested on the skin is tied also to a much bigger concern. Now, that's not to say that psoriatic arthritis is caused by a dysbiosis of the skin, but it definitely is not dis, uh, is definitely not excluding that possibility because we have evidence that shows that there is dysbiosis associated with things like psoriasis. The real question that we're all asking ourselves in the scientific community, is it causation or is it correlation? Is there a little bit of both? And that's really where all the science is really trying hard to understand. Um, you know, it's the chicken or the egg type of uh, question here that we're trying to parse out. Presumably, you think that this is one of the biggest areas to unfold in medical science over the next decade or so. We're going to find more and more out and it's going to be a big focus for scientific study, would you say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, even the stuff we're seeing in our own clinic is kind of mind boggling as far as simple modulation of the skin ecosystem can improve disease states um, that we would not have expected it to improve. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's other questions I think some of your viewers had asked that I think will tie into this a little bit. But yeah, I think absolutely one of the biggest thing that I think we're learning is, you know, all of the benefits that we've reaped from these great drugs and biologics and things that we've developed over the years, I think we're going to realize that our bodies, when working properly, when balanced, actually produce a lot. That's where a lot of these biologics and stuff come from, is from molecules that we know are uh, present in working uh, healthy individuals. And so is there a way to augment those things without actually introducing foreign or, or xenobiotic type stuff and actually using the body's own ecosystem to actually modulate it? And sometimes it will be possible. Sometimes it won't. So if somebody has a genetic mutation, that's a different story because then mm. that's why they're not functioning properly. And so I think there's going to be kind of an advance in kind of looking at somebody's genetic state, their habits, their uh, ecosystems, and then seeing what, how to integrate those things together in order to modulate them uh, in an appropriate way. And I suppose, like so many things, we're at that awkward stage now where we're starting to talk about this, starting to acknowledge it, um, starting to have our suspicions about ways in which we uh, can potentially harm our skin health, possibly our wider health, but we don't have all the pieces of the, the jigsaw in place. So, I mean, to to sort of break it down to a, a simple level, um, for those of us who are looking at skincare and, you know, trying to find a balance, do you think that poor skin health is always easily identifiable? And, and what I mean by that is, would there always be symptomatic clear signs on your skin so it would be very dry red irritated um possibly very sun damaged you know we would know uh if if we were harming our microbiome to a significant extent i don't know if i could definitively answer that i will say that it can be quite obvious but by mm -hmm. all those metrics that you mentioned Although uh, something that I think most people don't realize is that you can have chronic underlying inflammation, where uh, inflammation is something that we think about as redness, swelling, itchiness, mm -hmm. you know, puffiness. And while that is true, 
you have to also remember that inflammation is a broad term to explain a phenomenon, which is the recruitment of an immune reaction to uh, a specific site to deal with an issue. And so, for instance, if I and I, I talk about this when I lecture about things like microneedling, because when you take a like an insulin syringe and you poke at the skin, many times you won't even know that a hole was created. You won't necessarily see uh, redness and swelling and all that stuff because that micro injury, the body will still react to it. It's not going to say there's a hole in my skin that was just created. This there was a physical injury. I'm not going to deal with it. It will still deal with it, but th it does basically meter the response in association to the injury. So it says that isn't as big a deal. There's not as much incursion of microbes that aren't supposed to be there. So I'm not going to overreact mm -hmm. um, versus if I take, for instance, a uh, that same needle and I put it over a hot flame and make it red hot and then I poke my skin, I've now in in incurred a, a, a more than just a mechanical micro injury. I've caused large amount of injury because of the burn that I've created. And that is going to cause inflammation that is going to be much more robust. You're going to definitely see redness and swelling and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so when we think about low-level chronic inflammation in the skin, the manifestation may be relatively moderate and increase over time. And the problem, uh, you know, we age in general, right? So it's not like we can stop the aging process, but it can definitely be accelerated by things like chronic low-level inflammation. Mm. And identifying that, as you say, is uh, is the tricky part. I mean, since we we last spoke, um, I have completely stopped washing my face in the morning. So I just rinse it in the shower, <laughs> and um, at night I use a kind of oil based cleansing balm. And what I have noticed is that when I get out of the shower and I dry my skin, it doesn't feel tight. I don't rush to moisturize my skin, it's hydrating itself. And I think, well, that's got to be a good sign because for years I just thought it was normal that as soon as you came out of the shower and your skin dried, you were like that, you know, get me to the moisturizer. Um, but, you know, there's a there's a sign and you think, well, you can only go through little signs like that, that your your skin is healthy when it's doing the things I guess it was designed to do. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's really, you've, you've hit it. A, on a really salient point here, which is a lot of the things that we use for what we call skin care is to modulate things that we're causing. So, you know, in the years past, they would use like um, soaps and stuff, and then you have to use toners basically to adjust the pH because you, you raise the pH too high with the soaps. And then after the toners, which were typically stripping because they use things like alcohols and such, then you have to use moisturizers and such to try to counteract what you just did as well, because you just de-greased uh, the skin. Yeah. And so it's one of those things where, you know, I get it, you know, people do like the sensory kind of feeling of putting things on and all mm. that. That's great. But when it comes to what actually your skin requires, that's a very different thing. Um, you may not need to moisturize as often. If your skin is already moisturized, there's no reason to put on additional moisturizer. It doesn't yeah. add any particular benefit. And although a lot of um, brands will add, you know, fancy molecules and stuff, the real question is, are all those actually doing anything or are they just marketing? And we can't answer that question for every single SKU out there or any, every single product out there. But we can say that, you know, that's up to the consumer to know their bodies and know what they need. And so we had a lot of comments and questions from viewers. And what I've tried to do is is group them really into some of the most frequently asked. So a lot of people want to get your thoughts on specific skincare actives, which I know puts you in a bit of a tougher spot, but the biggest of them are of course, vitamin C, you know, topical antioxidants, chemical peels um, and exfoliants, and then retinoids. So I wondered if we could just quickly go through them one by one, you know, so vitamin C, I mean, for you, vitamin C, stroke, antioxidants, do you think they have a, a place in, in skin care? I do. Um, I will say, though, um, I believe and I have the data to back it, you know, over the years that our body's ecosystem produces a pretty significant amount of antioxidants itself. Um, vitamin C has other roles in the body. We all know we need that particular vitamin. Um, you know, if you don't, you'll get scurvy and, you know, you don't want that. 
Uh, but the fact is, you're not going to get that type of vitamin C systemically through your skin's absorption of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just not something that really happens. Uh, while you might get some that, uh, you know, because collagen production is re- requires vitamin C as well. It's, mm-hmm. it's part of the enzymatic process for m- maturation of collagen molecules. And it's funny because when I was doing tissue engineering, we actually had to use vitamin C. Otherwise, the cells would just basically fall to the bottom and, and wouldn't form a blood vessel. It's uh, if you had vitamin C, then it can produce the collagen and, and such. But um, so it's very essential as a vitamin. The real question is, is it essential for the skin topically for the skin in general? Yes. But you probably can get a lot of that through your diet. Um, Through the skin, it's used as a brightening agent as well. And it's well known to be a tyrosinase inhibitor. What was that? What what does it inhibit? Sorry. Tyrosinase. So basically um, tyrosine and uh, there's a reaction that happens to produce melanin in the skin. And so for... Um, issues of the skin that are overproducing melanin or what we call hyperpigmentation, you actually inhibit the tyrosinase and you can therefore inhibit the production of melanin. And so it's well known that vitamin C is a tyrosinase inhibitor, but guess what? So is propionic acid, which is produced. It's a short chain fatty acids produced by the uh, C acnes, which is the most prolific microbe that lives inside of the follicles. Uh, and so the real question is, are you going to see uh, benefits on top of that or is in lieu of that? And the, the, the jury is still out because, you know, we do know that people that get melasma, we, we don't have enough data to show, is it because they're overwashing their skin, therefore they're taking away that short chain fatty acid. Uh, we do know it's associated with some demographics more than others, like the Asian uh, market, they tend to have a lot of melasma where uh, it's less so in the Caucasian markets, although you know, women in general tend to have more than men. Mm. Um, and so there, there is some instance in which you have to, we have to ask ourselves a question, uh, does vitamin C play a bigger role uh, that the body can't, you know, take care of on its own when it's in symbiosis? And so that's really where I'd say, you know, if you are using a vitamin C and it's working for you, there's no reason to stop. The only thing I would say as a caveat to that is, you got to know what the rest of the formula is because there's never a pure vitamin C serum out there. It has a bunch of other things typically in it. And so you want to make sure you're finding one that's pretty compatible. So I say, as a rule of thumb, look for things with the fewest ingredients. Mm. Uh, You you do want to make sure it's preserved because vitamin C is very difficult to keep stable in a product. I normally keep mine in the fridge. The next one is chemical peels and exfoliants. And I noticed in your book, uh, you had more positive things to say about salicylic acid. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and I'm probably getting ready in the not too distant future to put out the second edition of the book, because there's, even after we've written it, there's still, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of evolving. You're going to get a second and a third and a fourth. and a, <laughs> There's a lot to come. It's true. At some point, you just need to do a second book, you know, yeah. because uh, yeah, there's a lot that's changing. And one of the things was, you know, salicylic acid, at first we thought uh, it was compatible with the skin microbes, and then we thought it wasn't. And then, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, it's about um, dosage, you know, dosage really matters when it comes to all the things we're discussing, you know, in medicine and in biology, there's this kind of uh, misconception, I think, that more is better. Like, you know, a lot of marketing speaks to the more is better mentality, which in in science and in biology, that's not how it works. There's usually a very, very acute dosage curve where there's a peak that you need. And then after that, it becomes deleterious. And before that, it's not as good. And so um, when you see all these fancy things uh, in the skincare market, you really have to ask yourselves, well, is that dosage backed by what's best for my skin or is it a marketing play because they want to say we're one upping Mm -hmm. this other company and um so with the uh, salicylic acid that's where you have um, a monograph for salicylic salicylic acid for um acne in the united states i'm not sure in uh in your territory whether it's uh over the counter uh or if it's just cosmetic in nature but um so there's a certain percentage that is a approved for treatment of acne. And then there's other levels which are used a little, probably a little stronger that are used for peeling and such. Mm -hmm. And the real question is, what is the benefit of doing that Mm -hmm. versus allowing the skin to disclaim naturally? 
Now, and uh, explain disclaim for us again. Sure. So when you think about the surface of the skin, there's a, a layer that's at the very uh, out, outer part of the skin called the stratum corneum, which is what people call dead skin cells. But it's actually more complicated than that because mm -hmm. these are basically keratinocytes, which make up the epidermis, which is the li living the outer portion mm -hmm. of the skin, the most reactive part of the skin. And as they age, they start to flatten out and they kind of, they do desiccate or kind of like a mummy would you know, become like a mummy, but they're still connected by this lattice network where they're all, they have these microfibrils that actually connect these, uh, what we call carot um, um, corneocytes, which is a keratinocyte that's been mummified. Um, and they're still basically a part of the ecosystem in which they protect the epidermal layer. Um, they also house a lot of them uh, superficial microbiota there's a lot of the oils and stuff that's keeping that what we call skin barrier intact so that you're not losing water and you're not letting things in that you shouldn't. And so we don't want to over desquame because when we what happens is naturally things like or, or microbes like um, Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is one of the commensal kind of microbes that live on the surface of the skin, uh, it actually some, uh, secretes a protease, which is a an enzyme that secretes or that uh, digests certain proteins, very targeted proteins, and it, it targets the these chains that connect these these uh, corneocytes. And um, so naturally, the the ecosystem is causing those chains to break on the outermost and letting this those cells flake off. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call desquamation, which is what people think of as what you want with a peel. You want to remove that outermost layer. But what most people don't realize is that that outermost layer is very thin. I mean, very thin on your face. Uh, it's it's relatively thick on the palms and on the soles of the feet, but on the face, it is extremely thin. And so um, if you are not, uh, I think part of the problem is that a lot of people, because of the fact that they're using a lot of topicals that are reducing the amount of microbes on the surface, like Staph Epi, that are, re or that are, changing the pH or something that's changing the activity of the protease, it can actually make it to where you start to get dull skin because you're accumulating some of, you're not disclaiming as much as you should. And therefore people are saying, well, then I'll use a peel to counteract that so I can kind of remove that, that, that dullness, that outer surface, where in reality is, well, maybe you could avoid that in the first place if you weren't using too many things. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think uh, people are attracted to having, you know, you might say, oh, having that outer layer sort of dulls, dulls the skin and they want to have that kind of shiny, youthful, you know, which is why you use the peels and so on. Um, they've always been a little bit too much for my skin, so I've, I've kind of stayed away from it. But I, I can see the attraction. Um, but what you're saying is that each layer actually plays an important role of its own. Yeah, and I think people also use it um, because it seems to help with um, the appearance of fine lines. Mm -hmm. um, because if you desquame the skin, you know, the, the more layers you have on top of a wrinkle, the more the wrinkle is going to show up. Um, but also the fact is light, when you have certain layers, if you have too many layers of skin uh, that are corneocytes, light diffracts uh, based off of what it's hitting, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have dry skin versus more oily skin, it's going to change how your skin appears under light. Um, the same as if you have a proper amount of hydration versus too much, which is oily, you can see that. And that's what you're talking about, that glow. Yeah. That glow that you're talking about is based off, is, is really the way that light reflects and diffracts from our skin. Mm -hmm. And that's really what people are, are aiming to do. But at the end of the day, um, healthy skin uh, is going to have that glow simply because it's properly disclaimed. It's not overly dry, it's not overly yeah. oily, and it's not overly disclaimed. Um, if you overly disclaim, you could also cause irritation and get some of that underlying chronic low-level inflammation, which uh, at first glance might actually be appealing because it can cause a little puffiness, which can also reduce the appearance of wrinkles. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so the real question is, is that a good trade-off for you because it can also accelerate aging overall? It's complicated. Um, 
<laughs> I know, I know. And I, I realize there's no, you know, everybody's skin's different. And it's not that you're particularly saying it's a right or wrong. It's the, it's the trade off with these things, isn't it? And uh, again, comes back to monitoring your own skin health. How naturally hydrated is it? Because I always think the better hydrated, naturally hydrated my skin is, the more youthful it looks. It's just a given. So to me, it's how do I get that hydration into my skin? Drinking water and electrolytes can really help your skin as well. Um, you know, th that's where, again, it's all connected. You really have to, oh, actually she takes a drink of water. Yeah, it's all connected. And that's where I think a lot of us need to realize that um, the answer is not always in a new fancy skin topical. Mm. Sometimes it's about assessing our habits overall and seeing whether like, am I drinking too much alcohol? Mm -hmm. Am I not drinking enough water? Mm -hmm. Am I taking, am I ingesting too many sugary or refined foods? Because all that can play into the overall balance of the skin. Um, some people may say, you know what, I want my cake and I want to eat it too, uh, literally. And so, you know, that, that to those people, they, they're going to have to adopt a very different regimen than those people that want an overall holistically healthy lifestyle. I want to move on to retinoids. Um, it was an area you didn't want to get too drawn into, and I can understand why. There's a lot of debate around it. But um, from your podcast, uh, what I think I heard you say was that retinoids reduce the lipid secretions of the skin. Um, so likely why they can be drying too. And we know that microbes like to feed off these natural secretions in our skin, the oil, the sebum. Um, right. I, and you said also that they can increase the pH of our skin and we want to have a lower pH for a healthy microbiome. I guess for those of us who are using retinoids, I, I said last time I do, I use them a couple of times a week. If we have healthy skin, skin that's not dry, it's not irritated, it's well balanced, does it matter? Or would we be seeing any negative effects? Let me just clarify, um, you know, retinoid, not all retinoids are the same. There's different forms. So mm -hmm. retinoids, basically, there's a, there's a pathway. So retinoic acid is really the form that the body uses. That's like the retin-A, tretinoin. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. And then there's isotretinoin as well, which is a derivative of that. And the tretinoin and isotretinoin can be the ones that are a little bit more drying, uh, especially the isotretinoin which is known to actually modulate sebum production. That's why people that take Accutane and such get very dry skin. Yes, if you've got too much oil, you're getting acne, that can actually, for a period of time, be helpful for you. Of course, yes. Yeah. And it's one of those things where, you know, there's a, a lot of people that um, think, I, I actually saw the, the word on one of the comments from your video, fear monger. And it's not about fear monger. And I try to instill fear that people can't use anything. You know, Accutane has helped a lot of people, um, but the thing is, has to, just like everything, the, the context is important. It needs to be used thoughtfully and intentionally because mm -hmm. the dysbiosis will not be solved by removing the oil. It, it will be um, moderated for a short amount of time. But unless you're going to be on that the rest of your life, it, you're going to have a rebound. Um, some people uh, find that it you know, it very much fixes the problem. Other people find that it doesn't. And then they have now uh, modulated skin for the worse, you know. And so it's one of those things where there are certain forms that are more uh, like retinal palmitate, the, the ester forms of retinoids, which need to be converted into like retinal or uh, then to, to retinoic acid. I mean, there's a, there's a pathway and retinoids actually go through in order to actually be actively used on the skin. Mm -hmm. Um that's so cause a lot of cosmetics use a, uh, a retinol um, ester uh, because that way they're fall a they fall within the monograph or the cosmetic allowances because a certain amount of retinoids is considered a, a medicine and and that's the, the rationale is because at a certain point you're going to start causing structure function issues because retin retinoic acid we have cells in our body that are very sensitive to retinoic acid. And that's the thing that it's a natural thing that our body produces it and uses it in small amounts. And so medicinally, by adding retinoic acid, you can cause the body to do what it's supposed to do, but you're kind of augmenting that process. So mm -hmm. as we age, of course, some things slow down. And so it's been thought that maybe because retinoic acid event, uh, initially was not used as a cosmetic, and then they found they're seeing some benefits to fine lines and wrinkles. 
Um, and so now it's used pretty much uh, across the board. And it seems like everybody wants to use them, even young people that really have no reason yes. to use them. And that's where uh, I would say if your body tolerates it, uh, it's a natural molecule that your body wants to use anyway. As long as your skin is tolerating it and you're using it thoughtfully and intentionally, there's no reason you can't be using it. Yeah. The biggest thing for me is, again, it goes back to what else is in the formula? Because it's not pure retinoic acid in your skin, your topical. There's other things in there as well. So that's, uh, I think that's a bigger question I think most people should be asking versus, can I use all these actives? The, the real question is, well, what else are you piling onto your skin when you're using these actives? Like preservatives, which are also disruptive to the microbiome. Correct. And, and, and other things as well. And so I, I like to use the analogy of um, food. So, you know, when you eat food, you don't eat 10 meals because you want 10 vitamins. You know, you try to find a nice, well-rounded meal that has the right amount of calories, the right, you know, nutrition and such. I mean, that's ideally what we should be doing. Of course, uh, Western culture, we, we tend to not do that as, eat as, mm. as well as we should. But the, the, the fact is, you know, you have to realize that in those 10 meals, you have more than 10 vitamins. You have a lot of ca extra calories. You have a lot of uh, extra fats, a lot of extra carbohydrates, you know. So that's really what I'm trying to tell people is that you, you have to realize that these topicals are not just inactive. There are other things in there as well. Okay, um, sunscreen. You are an advocate of, of using sunscreen because we know, of course, sun damage would be very damaging to the microbiome, I'm sure. But um, I noted from your book that some ingredients, including zinc oxide, which is in my sunscreen, uh, can have an antimicrobial effect. Um, is that a big deal? Because you were saying it could be sort of offset in a way. So, I mean, if you take my scenario, for example, I use a very light amount of, of a fermented oil on my face in the morning and let it sink in. And then I put my sunscreen on, which is zinc oxide and it has, um, it has some essential oils in there as well and that kind of thing. I mean, can that offset the effect of the zinc oxide? I know that you're not gonna be able to absolutely pinpoint this, but in, in your opinion? Sure. Well, the, the thing is, you know, it's this is a tough one because it seems like with all the sunscreens that are out there or some some yeah, sunscreens that are out there, um, it seems like somebody has a problem with all the molecules yes. in some capacity. Yeah. Um, the great news is that uh, if you let your skin biology or skin biome do its thing, it already produces natural SPF factors, but that doesn't mean that it's okay then to just go outside uh, ad nauseum and our ad nauseum is not the right word, but willy nilly me. Yeah. And, um, you know, just bake in the sun. Now you have, you have your schools of thought on this. I know that there's these people that talk about like, you need your vitamin D and all that. And you can get that very quickly going mm -hmm. outside. It doesn't take long. And, and so by walking into your car back and forth, you're going to get enough vitamin D through your skin. Um, there are also, you know, if you, if, you know, if you consider civilization as a whole, we have people that are in the Central Americas that are very untouched by Western culture that, you know, there's some tribes that are very much isolated and still hunter gatherer type of tribes, very few of them left. But when you look at their microbiomes and you're, you look at their skin, they don't get skin disease and they're in the sun all day long, no SPF, you know, that they use externally. And they don't get skin cancers and such. And so that being said, we're not those people. Genetically, we're not those people, as well as, um, you know, habit wise, we're not those people. We eat different foods. We, um, you know, and there's the, the, the body is interesting because we tend to have certain mechanisms that protect us. But then if they're not used, they, they kind of go dormant. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like this idea that if we're going in and out of the sun, we're spiking and reducing these, these protective mm -hmm. mechanisms, which can actually have deleterious effects as well. The body doesn't like yo-yoing. Um, and so all that is to say with zinc oxide, which is actually probably the ingredient for SPF, I would recommend above the other ones. Okay. Uh, the problem is it can be a little whitening, um, which a lot of darker skin tones don't particularly like. Um, and white, uh, you know, light skin tones like you and I, we don't necessarily have as much of an issue mm -hmm. because it, it matches more of our tone. Uh, but the there are some great uh, 
technologies that are coming into play that can do multiple things. The first is we have actually one that we're working on in our R&D that seems to be microbiome compatible, even though it is zinc oxide. It's the way in which it's coded. It's the way in which it's just dispersed. And like you said, if you put a nice, if you have a nice oil layer on, uh, regardless of whether it's your own oils that you're producing or your one that you're actually placing mm-hmm. on your skin, that can be very protective to the microbiota because uh, especially if you're putting something that's a emulsion or um, a water-based thing, it won't really penetrate the oils. It'll lay on top. And the way that uh, zinc, uh, zinc oxide sunscreen will work is it usually has a film former that basically causes that zinc to stay in that film layer, not to like go anywhere else. Because the idea is you want that nice, even layer of zinc to protect from the sun. Mm. So most good zinc oxide formulations, if used properly, will not affect the microbiota too much. Okay. Uh, that Because it's going to just form that film. Now, mm. will it affect the outermost? Maybe a little bit, but the mm. outermost is usually the transient microbes. It's usually not the established microbiota or the engrafted. Okay. Um, makeup, I've been asked about. Um, do you have thoughts on whether makeup like foundation and primers can be terribly disruptive to our skin microbiome? Or, you know, if they're sitting on top of a skincare base, is it pretty similar to sunscreen? Uh, well, it's tough because there's a lot of different formulations out there of mm-hmm. makeup, uh, some that are probably going to be better than others. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I would say is, again, it's based on the formula. You know, the formula, what else is in the formulation? I will say, though, that some of the things that we use to pigment makeup, like iron oxides and such, uh, have been shown to be free radical formers, which is not really good, not just for the microbiota or the skin biome, but for the skin cells themselves. But again, it comes down to what is on the skin already. Do you have a nice foundation, not makeup foundation, but foundation of the, yeah. the of the oils and such? Are you overstripping the oils? If your skin is overall in good health, uh, a light foundation or something probably will sit over the, yeah. uh, the oils and such. But again, it comes down to j- the formulation, but also the way that you put it on. I know that um, a lot of people are using the sponge to kind of tap it on mm-hmm. versus the brush, which is actually going to, take the emulsifiers and actually get into the oils of your skin and mix it more down deeper. So it really, mm-hmm. it really comes down to, uh, there's multiple facets around how do you put your makeup on? How do you prep your skin before the makeup? Um, you know, primers are an interesting one because y- you think about um, certain primers uh, that have are high in silicone. Uh, silicone has been used for scars for many years and it's it's one of those things where you you ask yourself well why does it help with scars what is happening is it just the occlusion the Mm -hmm. occlusive way in which it because in that sense could it be used as a primer where it's going to have very little effect on the skin biome if anything have a a good effect on the skin biome where you know but the thing is silicones are also not great for the environment Mm -hmm. in the way exactly it's there's what that's something that I've recently started thinking about because, um, you know, it's not just about uh, how to create a topical that's that's going to be effective. It's about also thinking holistically, how is that going to be accepted by consumers because of the effect on the environment, as well as, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, well, since we last spoke, I've also stopped wearing foundation. I mean, you've really killed my fun. <laughs> Well, your skin looks great. So if you're well, not, wearing- I'm using. I just use concealer now. So you know, concealer in a few sort of areas, like under my eyes or whatever. And that's what I used to do when I was younger. Yeah. And I just got into the habit. Like, like you say, it's about being mindful about some of the stuff we're using. Why am I using this? So I put my blusher on, which is a powder blusher, that kind of thing. So I've made these small changes, and you know what? They don't really, you know, affect my look but i think actually the natural skin shining through is probably less aging oh i think you look quite radiant actually thank you very much the light helps as well (laughs) always make sure i'm sitting under a good light i actually thought it was funny that you're somebody commented about uh using filters and stuff like that it's like you know i've never used a filter but the thing is uh i know that some of these devices do like automatic Yes. Stuff and I, so I really don't know how to fix any of that. But I will say that most of the time it's just because I'm not in focus. 
<laughs> you know, so. Well, that's it. I um, I yeah, I, I've been accused of of using filters, and it's always when I do the Zoom calls, yeah, and it's right. because it's, it's, the quality. Yeah. it's a loss of quality at the end of the day um, that makes it that loss of quality when compared to doing your piece to camera at the start right. makes people think mm, that doesn't look genuine. So. Um, no, I probably should use filters if I was smart, but I don't. So there we go. No, I, you know, I, I think, I mean, you say that tongue in cheek, and I, I, I think it is funny to say because I say similar things. But at the end of the day, we, um, we're, no, uh, I think society started to normalize flawless skin where nobody really has yeah. flawless skin. Some people, it's pretty close, you know, and good for them. But, yeah. uh, you know, for those of us, you know, who had acne when we were younger or whatnot, Hopefully, like, for instance, I had chicken pox, so I have some pox scars from when mm -hmm. I was a child. And my nephews and nieces don't have to go through that because now they have the vaccine, so they don't get chicken pox like we used to. But um, that being said, uh, I, I do feel like we should all normalize and embrace the imperfections of our skin. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, and so I, I have no problem if I have a, you know, I, I don't have a filter if I look know whatever well your skin also it, it looks perfect but um no I, I get what you're saying and i think it gives you character i think with audrey hepburn who was one of the most beautiful women mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and as she aged people talked about how you know she had, she was getting wrinkles and whether that she was going to get surgery or whatever and she basically said something along the lines of i've earned every one of these why would i get rid of them yeah um, yeah i think i i'm hoping that more people can uh embrace that because even healthy skin ages even yes. a help, even the most healthy microbiome and healthy skin biome, it's going to age over time. It doesn't inhibit aging. It's just aging as well as you can. A lot of people as well, or a few, I'm overstating when I say a lot, but one that is very hot at the moment anyway, castor oil. So I saw a few people saying, oh, I use castor oil and I've started to use it around my eyes. I mean, I've, I've, I've caught the castor oil bug as well, just as an occlusive at the end of, of the evening. Instead of using these patches, like the silicon patches, I find something like that can be quite good for just holding in the moisture. But do you happen to know, is, is castor oil microbiome friendly? Is that something that you can say or not? Yes, it is. Right. You know, we actually have it in our live microbe formulation. So it's mm -hmm. actually in the formula that has a live microbes. We actually have castor oil in there. And um, we do find that it is uh, not just because really at the end of the day, you're not going to get human sebum into a product, right? You can't mm -hmm. bottle human oils, but you can buy you can bottle certain oils that are botanical in nature that actually mimic or very are closely associated. So for instance, jojoba oil mm -hmm. or castor oil or olive oil, the, these types of things can actually be super great for the skin because it helps to augment your own oil production. So for instance, if you wash your face and you've washed off some of the oil, a great thing is to put back a net more natural oil versus an artificial occlusive. Um, because an artificial occlusive is going to basically not breathe the same way. Mm -hmm. And then your skin will stop producing oils because it'll think I have too much barrier. You want something that's going to breathe the way that your skin oils breathe so that you can, again, you want homeostasis, you want balance. You yeah. don't want occlusion necessarily. Oh, that is really good to know. Great. We'll stick with the castor oil then. You mentioned your own skin range there. And um, I mean, it's an exciting innovation where you are putting uh sea acnes basically back onto the skin at uh, repopulating the skin um but i mean it's a bit like taking probiotics in that we still don't know the best probiotics to take for our guts so most nutritionists agree the better approach is to eat the right foods that create the right environment for your bacteria to flourish. And I had a couple of viewers making that point about the skin. I mean one Sabrina said I'm not convinced that singling out one microbe is the answer. It makes more sense to feed the good stuff that's already there so it can do what it does best and to prevent overgrowth of the bad stuff, same as in the gut. So, I mean, what what's your thinking there? You know, you're putting one thing back on it, but could could we not be in danger there of kind of upsetting the, the, the natural microbiome? Well, that's a great question. And I'll, and I'll say, first off, the reason that I developed this technology mm -hmm. and this this philosophy was not because there was no need. 
Mm -hmm. It was because there is a need because Mm -hmm. there's people in Western society, most people, we have a tendency to over sanitize, to overwash, to to use too many products. And so the idea is trying to what I think people have termed rewild the skin. And again, it's not just by adding C. acnes. That is not where the, 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 the products stop. There's a concise number of products with only five products, really. And the whole idea is to put the right microbes on, but also the right food source and the right environment. The environment is absolutely more important than anything else, because if you don't have the right skin biome environment, you can't grow the right microbes. And so um, the, the C. acnes is simply because C. acnes as a species is the number one most prevalent species on the skin. When it comes to the balance of the uh, microflora of the skin, some it, it basically C. acnes is like at the hub of everything. It's not that you're trying to, not that you already have uh, a, a bad C. acnes that you're trying to repopulate, although some people may. Um, but the thing is, it's about if you're going to curate the right microbes, that's the one to do. Additionally, by putting them on topically, eventually they'll engraft, but topically, they actually just start producing lots of antioxidants and stuff that can give you all those benefits that you're using things like vitamin C and for and such mm-hmm. for. But one thing that I should say is that um, they're absolutely right mm-hmm. about it. Be the best thing that you can do is just let your body do its own thing. Yeah. The problem is most of us don't do that. Mm-hmm. So this is a way for people that want to have a Western type of, uh, you know, skin kind of habits, but in a way that's actually be more native in, uh, for, for our bodies. Uh, so really quickly, I'll, I'll mention like uh, the fact is, um, you know, with C. acnes, basically we talked about that desquaming. And so an example of this is that the Staphylococcus epidermidis that desquames the skin actually secretes antimicrobials against C. acnes. And C. acnes secretes antimicrobials against Staphylococcus species. And C. acnes actually inhibits the growth of fungus on the skin called melesthesia, which can actually contribute to acne and um, dandruff and stuff like that. Um, But melesthesia actually helps C. acnes to grow. So these things are all connected. And interestingly, if you look, uh, there was actually a a review article that just came out, and I'll try to send you the link so you can put it into Mm. the description. But it was so fascinating to me because it's it's kind of fulfilling, not fulfilling, but validating to me to read these things because um, in that it showed all these disease states, rosacea, sepdermatitis, um, atopic dermatitis, acne, uh, and others as well. And all the microbiota that are upregulated or, or uh, uh, upticked, uh, there's more of it in all the microbes that are less. And in the one, in the column across the board, that there was less in all these disease states was C. acnes. Right. Which is to me something that I've been trying to tell people is that that's the reason why we've identified the best form of this specific species, because it is true some of the species isn't great. But the fact is, in all these disease states, we see that a deficit of this one leads to basically a dysbiosis. I actually believe that the skin. Uh, microbiota is not as complicated as we think. I think most of these species are transient or surface that were just, you know, uh, falling on us and such in our environment, where I think the ones that are most important uh, are pretty solid across the board. It doesn't mean that we won't additional uh, add on additional strains or change whatever later on, but what our research has shown clinically and preclinically and, and such is that this is one that's at the hub of everything. But again, I don't want people to get caught up in just the species of microbe. It's the whole biome that's yeah. important. The yeah. environment is the most important, then the microbes, and then, yeah, the food source is important as well. But keep in mind, if you add a food source, there's very few things that feed only the good microbes. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times it feeds everything. It's there. And yeah. it's about, you know, everything together. Yeah, and I think I think that's what captured uh, the imagination, really, of me why I why I approached you to um, speak on the channel in the first place because of of an innovation like this, and also just the breadth of your knowledge around the skin microbiome. But also, I think we can all tell there is so much more to come on this, and we're gonna. You've come in with an early innovation. We're gonna see more products like this uh, coming onto the market. Uh, so. Um, I do have a viewer, somebody who's a regular and um, has a scientific background, and they always come in with really pertinent points. 
and um, they've said uh, that they want to challenge the skin microbiome industry and ask why animals raised in completely microbiome-free conditions actually have improved skin healing. And they cite a uh, research paper, which I will drop into the description for viewers to look at. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? That's a kind of, does, does, does it even matter? <laughs> the skin microbiome. It does matter. I, I think, and I appreciate that person's comment because the thing is, I want people to be skeptical. I want people to look into it because, you know, don't take my word for it. You do your own research. The, the fact is, you know, the reason why I even made the line that I did was because I saw that nobody was going this route. And I wanted to encourage people to start thinking the way of the skin biome, and how important it is to think of it from every facet. Um, you know, so it's not that I just was like, how can I make money? It's it's how can I uh, take the research that I'm doing and actually make a difference for people? Mm -hmm. And sure, I'm not going to just, you know, give it to some company and say, here, go make money. Of course, I want to. I I did the research. I came up with the philosophy. I would like to at least, you know, make a living. Um, as far as the research that this person is citing, thank you so much, because uh, I actually talk about a, a large part of one of the chapters of my book talks about germ-free animals. Uh, and so th this was a phenomenon. Actually, this debate was occurring in the early 1900s, late 1800s by people like Louis Pasteur. Um, so Louis Pasteur actually was on the side more of like what I'm on. And mm -hmm. his colleagues who were brilliant people were debating him saying we should basically sterilize the world because microbes are the source of all issues that are bad. Um, and uh, early on, there was people boasting that they had made germ-free chickens and such that were growing bigger and faster, and they were going to do it to the children and make the children bigger and faster. Um, and at the end of the day, what happened was that we did get far enough along in this research to where not only did we make germ-free animals, and we still use them for research, as is alluded to in this, uh, this person's question, but we made germ-free humans because there's people with uh, immunodeficiency uh, syndromes and such. And I, I don't know if you remember in the 70s, The Bubble Boy. Uh, yes, uh, Johnny Travolta that. played in a movie to mm -hmm. uh, as, as kind of a, a, about this particular individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a Jake Hall film that was a, kind of a spoof on it. Uh, but the thing is, this was a real person and there was several people. They don't really do it as much anymore because there's better therapies. But uh, basically, they kept these people in a bubble. And... All the research shows that the animals that are germ-free, as well as uh, the people that they've studied, none of them develop properly. And they tend to have neurological issues, uh, GI issues, all sorts of issues. So yes, while the germ-free animals may uh, have healed scar-free, the thing is, there's a ton of other things that they're not gonna have, they're gonna end up with neurological issues and GI issues. So it's it's that really is that a realistic trade-off? So you know, while wound healing might be one part where you can try to keep that sterile, you can't keep yourself sterile. And what we know is that when you try to keep yourself sterile, you actually get issues like atopic dermatitis and all these things. So at the end of the day, don't take my word for it. There are tons of research out there that you can look into and see what happens when you try to make something sterile. Um, and I just finally want to put a couple of points forward again about your product. I mean, people asking about price. Why is it expensive? A lot of skincare innovations are. I mean, bluntly, is that because of the level of research that has gone into these things in the background before you even launch them? What's it about? Well, um, there's several facets. So the first is, I think I saw something about why is it physician dispensed uh, versus yes. consumer. Uh, the rationale is that if somebody's been listening to this conversation and the other uh, couple of conversations we've had, uh, I've seen a lot of comments about, I didn't really get everything. Thank you for summarizing. Mm. And that's one of the main reasons why it's physician dispensed first, because I don't believe that there's enough uh, it, it's very difficult for a consumer to go to a store and understand why do I need this? Mm. Um, because it's not part of the zeitgeist yet. It's starting to become. But uh, the physicians are somebody that we can actually have people that are trained to go and teach the physicians. I can give talks to physicians and then physicians can therefore boil it down and then tell the consumer or their, their clients or their patients, here's why you should use this. Where a direct consumer, there's nobody at a grocery store or at an Ulta or these places telling you, 
oh, this is why you should use this. And so uh, I will say that the idea is that um, in the future, I definitely want to have a direct consumer skin buy online. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely in the plans. Uh, The thing is, we felt that having it through physicians first was important because it helps to educate the end consumer where you can't do that in, you know, a DTC type product quite yet. Um, That being said, if you sell something to physicians, it tends to be a little more expensive. Um, yeah. because physicians also need to make money too. Um, and that being said, you, what you said was correct, which is you have to remember that there is no infrastructure for what we're doing. We had to build out a whole microbiome institute to grow these microbes, to learn how to do what we're doing. You can't just go to an ingredient manufacturer and say, I want this because nobody makes it. It's, we're the only ones in the world that, that do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully it will change and become much cheaper uh, just as everything does as it becomes more prevalent. But right now, um, the infrastructure that is required to to do something like this is pretty large. And so that's why, unfortunately, it's, it's slightly expensive. You know, I always, if I am interviewing uh, someone who has a product at the end of the day, they've developed something, which I do a lot because the only way I feel I can cover skincare innovation is by talking to people who are innovating in skincare. And they will always have a product attached to that. From my point of view, I have learned a lot from you. And that is what I try to bring to the viewer. No, and I think you, that's why you're honest, Claire. (laughs) You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I get people's skepticism. And first and foremost, at least let's buy into the idea of taking good care of our skin health and prioritizing that above. Oh, absolutely. I would say, yeah, I would rather somebody take my advice of just reducing their skin regimen to a minimalist approach. Yeah. And going that route, it's like what I've produced is something so that they can actually have more of that luxury, you know, uh, skin regimen, but still get the rewilding of the skin. Mm -hmm. Um, But Mm -hmm. I would say all day, every day, if you can simplify to where you're not using any products, that's the best thing that you can possibly do, probably. Well, I mean, keep in touch because I'd love to hear, and I know my viewers would, about new innovations, new discoveries that you make. And if you have, if you get to the point where you're a direct consumer, you know, come back and let us know. Um, I, I know we'd all love to hear about that. Absolutely. I'd love to. Thank you so much. All right. Have a wonderful day. Well, I hope any questions you might have had were answered in that discussion. We're learning so much now about the skin microbiome, but it feels like the more we learn, the more we realize just how much we still don't know. So I'll be finding other experts to share their views and advice on this topic, and I'll link in the description to a video about how I've adapted my own skincare routine to support its microbiome and health. Do let us know in the comments what you think. And remember, you can find more advice and information from me on my website, honest.scott. For now, thanks for being here today.